really great resource to check out, especially during fall migration. And then Steve is right here. He's going to tell us about some field trips. Yeah, we got these field trips together too late to make the, the caller and uh, the website isn't working at the moment. So uh, this Saturday, we apparently have more than one field trip. I think Trish has got one she's gonna tell you about too. But the Muskegon Wastewater, which is now known as the Muskegon County Resource Recovery Center. <laughs> A little PR there. <laughs> well, that's, they've changed the signs out in the road. So if you're looking for the signs, that's what you have to look for. <laughs> But they're having their 50th anniversary celebration this Saturday from 10 till 2. And as part of that, I'm doing a uh, bird walk around their nature trail by the headquarters at 10.30, if anybody's interested in that. Uh, October 7th, uh, 7.30, um, Larry Burke is going to be heading out for the Saugatuck Dunes field trip. Uh, there's a Saugatuck Dunes State Park in Saugatuck, so they're meeting at the McDonald's in Hudsonville. Uh, if you don't want to head all the way back east uh, to Hudsonville, you can meet them at 8 at uh, Saugatuck Dunes Park. And on October 14th at 8.30 in the morning, uh, I'm doing a trip at Muskegon State Park and we're meet, meeting in the uh, South Beach parking lot at 8.30 there, right by the, uh, the lake. So those uh, probably didn't make the uh, caller. I think they probably are on Facebook. the Facebook. We'll get them on Facebook. Yeah, okay. I, I sent them in already, so they might be I'll, there already. I'll, I'll look but, for them. But I yeah. don't look at Facebook. So That's all right. They're there. I'll, I'll, so thank I'll you. <laughs> thank you, Steve. And I believe Becky, you're leading Pickerel Lake this Saturday from eight to ten, or eight starting at eight a.m. till yeah. whenever. So maybe you can hit up Pickerel Lake, go on a road trip. You don't want to know. Get out to Muskegon. <laughs> I I might do something like that for anyone who hasn't been out to Muskegon wastewater. I, my parents are visiting me from Massachusetts here, so thanks mom and dad for coming out. I took them out to Muskegon, formerly known as Wastewater yesterday, and we saw a lot of cool stuff. So they get to brag to all their friends when they go home that their daughter took them to the dump slash water <laughs> reclamation area. But if you've never been, there are just so many cool species out there. So definitely don't let the name, even the new name scare you away. Lots of cool things happening. And without further ado, our very own vice, oh can sorry, I just add one more thing. Yeah. So regarding field trips and ambassadorships, I would like to offer anybody who comes down to Florida, I'm pretty much there from now on until it's summertime again. And if you happen to be headed down there and you want somebody to show you some places mm -hmm. in the Fort Myers area, I would love to put my number somewhere. You can just text me, you can set something up, but as you said, it's always fun showing somebody something you love. So. Yes, that's what a generous offer. Thank you, Becky. Appreciate that. See, the birding community is wonderful, and we all love sharing knowledge and our enthusiasm. So, Speaking of somebody with lots of enthusiasm for nature and birds and all things, it's, it's, it's Spencer. <laughs> consulting and work with a lot of different uh, nonprofit organizations throughout the state doing graphic design and marketing, but uh, primarily focus on conservation groups because it's got a soft spot in my heart because I really like birds and just being outside in general. But uh, in my free time, I spend a lot of time uh, doing whatever interests me in the moment. And two years ago, uh, the Grand Rapids Curling League started, which was very fun to do because I'd always wanted to curl. I grew up playing pond hockey in a buddy's backyard, and we would curl with milk jugs, so to actually be able to officially curl for the first time was very fun. I joined a league, it was every uh, Sunday morning uh, from, I don't know, like 8 until 11 or so, go out for lunch afterwards. It was really fun. But my wife got really used to me, used to me not being in the house. And so when the league ended in spring, she was like, I really enjoy my own time. <laughs> You're gonna have to not be here because I work from home and I'm home all the time. And she was like, man, I 
really missed not having you here. <laughs> uh, and it just uh, coincidentally lined up really well with spring migration happening. And so recently, well, back then, recently, a bunch of people had asked me about birding. And so they had all said, like, you should take me out birding sometime. And I was like, yeah, yeah, sometime. That sounds great. Uh, but since my wife wanted me to be out of the house, I was like, I'm just gonna start inviting people on Sunday mornings. And so I started a ragtag gang of birding buddies of all these people that had always wanted to go birding with me but had never actually made it out into the field or like driven with me to go do all these different things. And so we're on our second year this year. Woo! Um, those are the two logos that I threw together because it's very fun. Each year I pick a different bird that I'm trying to go after that's on my wife's list. Uh, last year it was a common yellow throat and it was literally the third bird I saw on our first outing ever <laughs> together as Summer Sunday Birders and that was excellent. I was very happy about that. Same thing did not happen with Wilson Skylarope this year. Very disappointing. But. These are all of the public parks that we have visited over the oh, 44 summer Sundays that we've been going out. Uh, and you'll notice that one is up there in Alpena, which is not local, uh, but that's because we were invited to help lead a birding event this spring up on uh, North Point Peninsula, which uh, is mostly owned by Huron Pines, a organization that I work with um, out of the Gaylord and Alpena areas. Um, but we've got to go explore so many cool places. So this is our very first event. Can you guess where it is? Reeves Lake. One of the best spots to, to introduce people to birding because you are guaranteed to see something very cool. <laughs> Um, and uh, you may notice uh, Cynthia here it did not get the memo um, about which direction we all were looking for the now iconic photo series that we tend to do at least once a year. Um, but that first Sunday or first summer, we went to 20 or got together for 21 uh, different summer Sundays visited 18 public parks, walked 31.5 miles, the wonders of eBird being able to track and record all this data, uh, saw 112 species, counted 1,772 birds, which I guarantee is a low count. Uh, but if you're really good at math, that's 56.3 birds per mile. <laughs> that's my favorite stat. I track it all the time now. Uh, BPM, if, uh, <laughs> if you're in, in the know of the lingo. Uh, but we had 14 people join us uh, on outings, and all of those people did not know each other at the beginning of the summer, but we all kind of just continued to go out and see birds together and enjoy uh, this little community that we've kind of uh, created together. Um, this year, uh, that's out at Fallsburg Park, and uh, John got the memo uh, wrong <laughs> this year. Uh, he's looking the wrong direction. Uh, but this is out at Fallsburg Park. Um, wonderful stretch of the North Country Trail runs through there. You can start at the golf, this golf course. You can walk down to the covered bridge. It's very nice, and uh, I think we had like 48 species that day, so it was a great time to be outdoors. This year, so far, there's still two Sundays left, uh, but we've hit, uh, gotten together for 22 Sundays, visited 22 different locations, walked 36.4 miles, <coughs> have seen 138 species, uh, counted uh, 2,300 birds. I was very pleased that the math came out to a round number. It was just very satisfying to my soul. Uh, which works out to be 63.2 birds per mile, which I like seeing increases in stats. Um, but this year, my favorite stat that has increased is uh, 26 people have joined us for different events. And what I've come to realize is that we are all mutually discovering nature and learning from each other. We 
we've got people who are into birds, we've got people who are into rocks, we've got tree people, fungi people, mammal people. Everybody has something interesting to share, and we stop so many times to uh, give mushrooms a good pat. <laughs> uh, we have a uh, wiggle factor. Uh, so you, you hit a mushroom and you rate it on one to 10 and how wiggly it is. It's my favorite wiggle factor uh, thing. But um, everybody brings something unique to our walks. And we've realized, or I've at least realized that I'm more invested in the people than I am in the actual birds. Because getting together, being outdoors with these people that I've grown to love, is just such an immense joy and pleasure. And yeah, birds are really cool, and that's what brings us together. But it's the relationships that we've all made that keep us coming back. And the same thing kind of applies to this group of people here, right? Like, we all like birds. Birds bring us together, they're the reason why we're a club, but we like learning things together, coming together, chit-chatting with those people that we see once a month, but there's just something nice about it that satisfies the soul. Um, so birding's brought us together, but by intentionally creating time within the outdoors where we all can you know, just be ourselves and be weird and give mushrooms wiggle factor numbers. Um, you know, complete strangers, people that did not know each other at the beginning of the summer two years ago, have become very good friends, and it speaks to the power of uh, both the activity of birding, but people who are just interested in nature in general. Uh, there is a wonderful quote uh, from Chief Standing Bear uh, that says, the old Lakota was wise. He knew that man's heart away from nature becomes hard. He knew that lack of respect for growing, living things soon led to lack of respect for humans too, so he kept his children's close to nature's soft human influence. And that is, like, that just speaks to my core. Like, I have a very firm belief that uh, the more things you name, like, give a name to out in nature and the more species that you identify and give a name, it just instantly creates compassion. Like, you know that thing. And so the more we go on walks, the more we see these weird, beautiful things that are existing right outside our door, the more we're able to see those things in other places, and the more we want to protect them and continue to see them in other places so that we can continue to see cool birds, we can continue to give mushrooms with effectors and increase that birds per mile statistic but also species per mile statistic, and begin to see these nature, or natural species in their natural habitat um, continue to grow and continue to have spaces where they can uh, exist and thrive and be together. And so my own personal entry point into nature and conservation was through birds, but uh, each person has their own spark moment. You know, with birding, you've got your spark bird. Mine's the Canada warbler. But for the people who birds, it's not their primary driver to get them in the outdoors. They still have a special moment and a special connection with something out there that just speaks to their soul and to who they are. And some people that's seen a light, like absolutely dark sky park and all the stars are finally able to be seen. And astronomy is their passion and that's excellent. And every person is different. Like it, no two stories are exactly the same. And that continues to work throughout their life, lives to inspire them to protect the places where they naturally want to spend their time. So let's look at our communities as if they were ecosystems. And we can view each person uh, 
within these ecosystems as having a ecological niche and a specific role to play within the human ecosystem and human community that we all know both here and outside of here, you know, throughout West Michigan or throughout the other relationships and micro habitats, if you will, uh, that you encounter uh, throughout your days. Um, if each ecological niche is different amongst all of our flora and fauna, um, then each person has a unique role to play within our own communities. You know, the ecological niche of a tree is completely different than the ecological niche of a warbler. Um, but each is equally important for the continued uh, movement and development and functioning of the ecosystems in which each, both of them are found. And so as conservationists, we should be driven to help people discover their ecological niches and helping them feel a sense of belonging within all of our ecosystems, you know, whether that's the human ecosystems or even the uh, natural spaces that uh, you know, are throughout Kent County. Um, and so there's some stats to help back this up. Uh, people who have found a sense of belonging within nature are far more likely to care about the preservation of that space. Uh, that's because out of North Carolina, there was a research uh, study done, and it said that wildlife recreationists, both hunters and bird watchers, were four to five times more likely than non-recreationists to engage in conservation behaviors. Four to five times more likely is an insane driver of movement. And you can see the similarity between birders and hunters in that they understand that the spaces that they want to protect are places where they see value. And they understand that those places exist because people take care of them, because the, uh, those spaces provide the vital habitat for the species that they want to see, and they want to continue to see that in the future. So let's get into a couple of little analogies. Who here knows what the wood wide web is? Oh, prepare to have your minds blown. <laughs> this is one of my favorite things I've ever learned about. Uh, so in the forest, you've got mushrooms, right? Yes. Yeah, you know about this, right? You don't know the cool name of the wood wide web. Uh, so in a forest, you've got mushrooms. And some of these mushrooms, Worldwide, there's about 5,000 species of ectomycorrhizal fungi. It took me forever to learn how to say that. <laughs> but uh, these uh, <coughs> mushrooms play a crucial role within our forests because they allow trees to talk to each other. And so let's say you've got two different species here. You've got your white pine, you've got a red maple, and uh, Without the ectomycorrhizal fungi, when a pest or a disease sweeps through a forest, uh, the white pine here wouldn't be able to tell a white pine on the other side of the forest that a boar beetle or uh, you know some white pine blight disease. I'm, I don't know about tree diseases, but uh, that that is coming and that wouldn't allow the trees on the other side of the forest the opportunity to uh, produce their natural defenses and insecticides that these trees produce to uh, make sure that they continue to exist within the ecosystem. And so it's not too hard to imagine uh, that uh, You've got two different community members here, uh, and conservation organizations are here in the center, allowing these two unrelated uh, community members to connect and share information and make those bonds that make a forest healthy and strong and fulfilling even stronger. 
Um, but I think it applies more than uh, for today's audience, at least, uh, that uh, the Grand Rapids Autobahn Club and birding organizations uh, serves as that. You know, because we truly act as a conduit between all of us here and we offer opportunities for everybody to uh, learn from each other, uh, have a space where they feel like they belong, and uh, can you know, just have something in their lives that uh, makes them feel uh, valued and important and seen, uh, but also a place where they can learn things, go on fun trips, and uh, become even more active in the community other ways outside of this organization as well. And so by creating connections throughout our community that are rooted in a common interest in nature, we can build more compassionate and understanding communities at a broader sense uh, because these people are leaving uh, this place and taking that mentality of feeling seen and understood and that they matter out into the world and bringing that positivity into their daily lives. Um, so let's move on to talking about forest structure. Here's a classic sam example of a boreal forest. Um, uh, very common in the northern uh, lower Peninsula and Upper Peninsula, you've got uh, you know some white pines, some cedars, a few deciduous trees, but then in the understory here, you've got a whole different set of plants. Uh, you've got, uh, and most of them are like woody structures, so um, you've got plants like, um, oh, let's see, uh, Allegheny service berry, uh, cherries, um, some of the smaller growing trees that aren't classically, typically considered trees because they don't grow very big. Uh, but then underneath them, uh, growing in entirely mostly shade on the forest floor, you've got your ferns, your wildflowers, uh, mosses, but you also have your dead and rotting logs, your rocks, your streams, uh, those other very important parts within a forest that help make a forest what it is. And so each species within this specific, or within each specific zone has co-evolved to specifically fill an ecological niche that uh, is within that zone. And so um, each different section of the forest represent, or has, uh, a certain number of species that help in play a certain certain amount of ecological niches ugh, um, in order to support the entire ecosystem. So if you took all of the understory and forest floor species out of uh, a forest and it was only trees with just bare soil underneath, uh, it just it wouldn't be a healthy functioning ecosystem. But with all of the species that are intertwining and creating a vast complex of all of these individual relationships between all of these plants, you have a ecosystem that's able to uh, you know, rebound back after disturbances a lot more quickly, support a wider variety of uh, wildlife species, and it makes it a much richer place for us to explore and enjoy as well. Um, but there's many roles to play within our human ecosystems as well, other than those ones that are labeled as community leaders. You know, in a forest, the trees would be considered the community leaders because they're the ones that you picture if you close your eyes and you picture a forest. But a forest wouldn't be a forest if you didn't have all of those other species making up the understory and the forest floor. And that applies as well to our human ecosystems because the 
people may not be a traditional community leader in a sense, but that doesn't mean that they don't have intrinsic value for just being who they are. And so if you allow for people to discover their own way to support our communities and to trust them to fulfill that role and to naturally fall into the section of the human ecosystem in the role that's most comfortable for them and where they feel like they can support the community the most, then that is going to enrich everybody's life so much better. You know, it's you can't take somebody who's not um, you know, comfortable leading and forcing them to be a tree because that's just not who they were born to be. And that's okay. Um, you know, we have to allow people to play the role that they want to play and trust them to do that. But let's talk about my favorite thing. It's my garden. <laughs> I live really close to here. It's great. Um, my commute here for meetings is one minute. Uh, so that's where we are now, and that's my house. Uh, small little postage stamp of a property. Uh, it's roughly you know, like 0.125 acres or something like that. Um, but uh, in my backyard, I have a little garden. Uh, you can see my little dog Cooper there. Uh, he, he really likes exploring back there. Um, but this is when we moved in. Um, well, the first spring after we moved in in October of 2019. And you can see back here there's a common buckthorn tree, which is invasive. You've got Danes around it, which is invasive. This is all ground elder, which is, uh, I would like to classify it as invasive. Um, a bunch of uh, weedy stuff that had not been taken care of for years, and I knew that had to change. Uh, this was my garden three weeks ago, um, so I now have, uh, well, I did a lot of research, and uh, this was my hobby for uh, when curling wasn't happening, um, <laughs> but I have kind of uh, done a lot of landscaping work and uh, kept my garage from flooding because when we moved in, it flooded. And so I had to build a retaining wall and then I planted part of the garden, but all in all, uh, the garden space is a little over three parking lots, uh, parking lot spaces, so kind of help you picture how big it is in your head. But I have 120 species of native plants very fun um, for me to, I think I'm like slowly becoming a botanist, but I don't really know. <laughs> um, but also kind of an entomologist and a little bit of everything. But let's go through some of my favorite plants, uh, because uh, as I've watched all of these uh, plants interact and like develop and form relationships with one, an one another, it's been really rewarding for me to see them like come back year after year and like one plant uh, isn't where I planted it anymore. It, like it moved like 10 feet and I think it's only through seed, but uh, one of the culprits that I think might have done it is uh, this guy, Canadian Wood Detonate. Uh, this is a very uh, unknown and underappreciated plant um, because it is hemiparasitic, um, which means that it produces its own chlorophyll, but kind of like the ectomycorrhizal fungi, its roots attach to all of the surrounding plants around it, and it siphons energy off of them. Mm -hmm. And so one of the plants that moved, uh, the one that moved 10 feet, uh, is planted smack dab in the middle of a patch of these guys. And I think that what happened is uh, this plant limited or like suppressed the growth of the plant 
uh, where it was, and so it sends some seeds out and was like, I prefer growing over here <laughs> where this guy can't reach me. Um, but uh, this shows up in the early spring and uh, is a great nectar source for bumblebees. And uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for bumblebees. Uh, so most of my plants are uh, specifically planted to be bumblebee supporting pollination plants. Um, and this one I think is my favorite. But uh, another great one uh, in the early springtime is Virginia waterleaf. Um, bumblebees equally love the little clusters of white flowers. Um, this one's kind of getting out of control and spreading throughout my entire yard. Somehow it got to my front yard, uh, which they don't have wind pollinated seeds, so I don't really know how that happened. Um, I am going to guess shrews or mice, but got no idea. Another favorite is our only species of cacti, the prickly pear. Um, I've got a really cool video. Um, I couldn't include it in the presentation, but of a ant uh, pollinating uh, one of the flowers here, and uh, one of the benefits that I've realized of planting my native plant garden is that I no longer have ants in my house. And because they have all of the food and sustenance that they need right outside my door. And so that's great. I don't have pests. For the rest of them, I've got neighborhood spiders that I just don't bother with. Um, but uh, the ants are incredibly powerful pollinators, and it's a little like it was a little bit weird to like realize that. Um, but there's a couple of species of plants in my garden that are only pollinated by plant by ants, uh, including wild ginger. Um, if anybody has that, it grows great in the shade, and um, they have really weird shaped flowers. Um, but they're great. Anything that smells like rotting death is usually either pollinated by ants or flies, uh, because flies are almost as efficient and uh, important pollinators as bees, which uh, I had no idea about before I planted my garden. But it was, uh, you know, it's through just sitting out in my garden which started as birding, but um, slowly transformed into me uh, looking at the absolute wonders of things that are happening in just my backyard, not even a mile from here. Another good one is false Solomon seal. I don't have any cool facts about this one, I just really like the flowers. Um, and the leaves are incredibly soft and they make these really cool, weird shaped red berries uh, on the end of the stalks, um, which are poisonous, so do not eat them. Another great one is spotted bee balm. Um, this one is another one of those great uh, bumblebee pollin pollinator plants, um, and their flowers are shaped like that because as the bee shoves its little head into uh, the little uh, indent in the flower there uh, to stick its tongue in there. Uh, the stamen, uh, which are at the top of the flower, get on its back. And then as it goes from flower to flower, its back rubs against all of them. And so uh, any flower that is shaped like this is uh, typically pollinated by bumblebees and long-tongued bees or hummingbirds because I see a lot of them in my yard. Um, and so that's like a form of evolution to a certain extent um, because the flowers kind of realized, hey, that was a very successful way to pollinate, so maybe I should continue to make my flower shape that way. Um, and bumblebees love it, but what love it even more are uh, great black wasps. They're about that big, and they are, like, you can hear them flying, 
and they, they're not going to mess with you uh, because wasps are also incredible pollinators. You, like, they, I have seen so many species of wasps in my backyard, and I had zero appreciation for wasps before I had planted my garden. But wasps are so interesting because they're like the first, like, the more ancient version of bees on like the evolutionary tree or whatever. Um, wild, and I don't understand a lot about them. But um, it's been fun to learn about. Uh, and bee balm, or spotted bee balm, and uh, another flower bone set uh, that we'll talk about in a minute are uh, wasp heaven. Um, and Wasps get a really bad rep because uh, they don't want anything to do with you, and a lot of people are afraid of wasps because they're greedy and stuff. But they just want to pollinate, lay their eggs, and die. And that's <laughs> their entire <laughs> life cycle, basically. So uh, just don't try to squish them; you'll be, you'll be okay. Uh, another great one is uh, butterfly milkweed. Everybody loves milkweed. There's 17 species of milkweed in Michigan, which is just crazy to me. Um, and a lot of them I didn't know about uh, before I did my deep dive into uh, native plant species. Um, but this is one of my favorites because uh, it is it just really stands out in my garden and uh, is a absolute pollinator magnet and. Uh, for some reason this year I had like 24 monarch caterpillars on it, like two plants. I don't know why, because last year there weren't any, and they were all on my common milkweed instead. And so I don't, I'm not going to ask questions. Well, I can ask questions, but I'm not going to argue. Just let them do their own thing. Uh, but this time of year, uh, one of the plants that uh, Chris Bear said that was at Maher is uh, my favorite, of, well, second favorite of this time of year. The New England Aster. Uh, great big purple flowers with these bright yellow centers. And you can see up there uh, is a pure green sweat bee, um, which is, they always just catch your eye when you're sitting there staring at a flower and you have a little jewel fly past your face. Um, and also the five million flowers that are on Calico Aster. Um, I was talking with my wife yesterday and I was like, how many flowers do you think are outside right now? And she was like, I have no idea, but I would say north of 4,000 individual flowers. And I think that's a drastic understatement because I like I've got at least ten of these. And does anybody want to like actually count the flowers there? <laughs> but the bumblebees are over here all day, every day, and so I get distracted by them. Bumblebees are great. Um, this is one of my favorite bumblebee pollination plants. Oh, well, it's specialized pollinators. Plants. Um, this is a bottle gentian. It's one of Michigan's latest blooming flowers. Um, the flowers are closed, and the only species that is able to muscle its way in there are bumblebees, and it is one of their favorites. And um, so this flower will be blooming until probably November first. Um, so it provides a lot of uh, late season nectar and food sources for these bumblebees as they're preparing their nests and going uh, into, well, the queen's only going into hibernation because everybody else does. Uh, survival of the queen that is at almost every bumblebee's mission in life. Um, but the life within my garden is always changing and always <coughs> So every day is an opportunity to learn. 
Here is a monarch caterpillar egg. This little itty bitty thing. It's got little stripes on it. It's very, it kind of looks like that dude from Beetlejuice. I think, is that his name, Beetlejuice? I've never seen it. Um, but I've gotten to watch uh, monarchs laying their eggs. Um, Uh, it's really fun to watch. Uh, they're wild about where they choose to put them. Um, but they eventually turn into uh, these fun guys. And so then I bring them into my screened in porch and watch them turn into a chrysalis. And I watch them turn into these guys. I try to do this at least once a year because it's just super fun. Um, yeah, I, it's also like very majestic. So things that just kind of speaks to the soul. Um, but they are not the only ones who are using my garden as a uh, place to rear their young. Uh, we've got uh, Virginia tiger, moth caterpillars, American painted ladies. Uh, these were on uh, pearling, e pearly everlastings, uh, which is a fun uh, white flower that blooms from like August until November. It's really, it's a, it truly is everlasting. Uh, but this year I had about 90 of these caterpillars on five or six different plants. And so much so that uh, they completely ate all the leaves off of <laughs> one half of the garden. And the other half of the garden had like some, but not a lot. Um, and so the blooms of that flower on this side are excellent this year, and on this side they're just stunted and smaller. And that's fine. Because they're gonna, they're, these species have uh, co evolved with the insects that feed on them, and so the plants have developed a response because they know American painted ladies are going to come and lay eggs on them, and so the plant itself is like, all right, I'm just gonna store extra energy down my roots, and when the caterpillars eat me clean, I can still have enough energy to um, produce more leaves and then produce more flowers so that I can send out at least a few seeds and continue them to the next generation. But because there is so much space for uh, caterpillars to grow, I get a bunch of very cool uh, moths, butterflies, and other things. This is a Nessus Sphinx moth. It's a little Nessus Sphinx moth, uh, which is a hummingbird moth, a fun example of convergent evolution um, because they fill the same ecological niche as a hummingbird. Hover from flower to flower, have a really long tongue that sticks down into uh, the flowers of plants like spotted bee balm. And uh, so I found this guy nestling uh, under that same pearly everlasting, and I found it while looking for these guys. And so that was a very fun surprise because I had never seen one actually at rest before in my garden. Um, I really like hummingbird moths. They're just really cool, weird looking things. Um, but I also get a bunch of other weird, cool moths like this Atlantis web worm moth. I think that's how you say that. I don't know. I haven't studied the Latin. Uh, but they're a fun one. And they show up Lebanon, my golden rod in the fall. You might have seen them have a little orc or something because they kind of tend to congregate in mass. Um, but I was very surprised to see this maple clearwing moth, which I did not know exist at all, because I thought that that was a uh, wasp at first when I saw it. But uh, that moth there is essentially the same thing as this. It fulfills the same ecological niche as a hummingbird, just at a extremely smaller scale. 
Um, that flower there is a daisy flea mane, and it's about the size of my pinky. And so it is way smaller. I don't know why it is what it is, but it fulfills its ecological niche. It exists, and it has a home in my backyard. And here's the bumblebees. Uh, this is a confusing bumblebee, and I, I did not just put confusing there because I don't know what it is. Uh, it's lightning's bombus perplexus, which is one of the more fun ones. Um, but I was very pleased to see that because that is the fourth species of bumblebee that I have seen in my backyard. Um, and it's relatively rare, so to see it visiting my backyard uh, has been great. Um, I, another side tangent about bumblebees, I know this is a bird club, but bird, bird, like birding got me really into like checking off species from my life list and collecting as many as I could, um, which very quickly uh, evolved into collecting bee species from my life list. And uh, so it's gotten, or it's been really fun to learn about all these different species and figure out what uh, kind of make them irk in a way. Like, what, what can I do to attract them to my lawn and create better habitat for them? And I had read an article about bumblebee houses, and uh, the common eastern bumblebee has been domesticated at some point uh, as a pollinator plant for, or pollinator species for farms and other things like that. Um, and so I wanted to try that in my backyard. So I made a very uh, makeshift one out of a flower pot earlier this spring. Kind of threw it together. I was like, yeah, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, I had a bumblebee make a hive, not in my bumblebee house, but next to my bumblebee house. <laughs> Just in the ground. I at least attracted a bumblebee to have a hive in my yard, so it's whatever. Um, but uh, we, I have also seen uh, two, sp two spotted longhorn bees which look just like bumblebees, but they, for some reason, are not. Um, these guys are entirely black, which is really cool to see. And I don't know if that's why they are not considered bumblebees, but um, I see about two or three of these a year. Um, so I was very pleased to see one on a plant that I did not plant, but it just showed up. Uh, this is evening primrose. Uh, a lot of the plants in my yard are just naturally occurring, and I don't pull them. I wait for them to go to flower. I identify them. If they're native, I just let them do their thing. If they're not native, I try to pull them out by the root, and I'm just letting the plants live their lives. And it's been fun to see species like this guy taking a, a pollen bath. Um, you, you can see its legs here. Um, that is entirely covered in pollen. That's not part of the flower. Uh, it's like he's wearing pollen pants. <laughs> but then you get all sorts of other weird smaller bees, like this southern bronze furrow bee, um, which looks more like a European honeybee. Um, but these guys a completely different ecological role. Um, in Michigan, we've got a lot of different types of bees, but, um, well, we have 450 bee species, but in North America, there's over 4,000 species of bees. And uh, they're, because they're so small, there's a lot that haven't been discovered yet, um, or haven't been identified at all. Um, by science, just because, uh, can you imagine trying to find a bee in the middle of a forest? It's like, good luck. Um, but this guy's relatively small, and I don't have any fun facts about him. I just like him. This is another one of my favorites, uh, the bicolored striped sweat bee. 
And these guys I always see on plants that are more open-faced uh, like this. And that's because their undersides are extremely hairy. And so the flowers have been less than. Our good way of uh, getting pollinated is by these little tiny bees that have very short legs dragging their tummies across us. Mm. Um, they're purely metallic and uh, kind of like that pure green sweat bee, uh, just super cool to see. Um, but the bees come in all shapes and sizes uh, because this is a zephyr sweat bee, I think. I don't know, it's way too small. That's just the closest I could get with my identification. And sweat bees are cool uh, because they, uh, to get added electrolytes, uh, they'll let you in your skin lick sweat off of you for the salt, uh, which is uh, kind of concerning when you first see a bee that won't leave you alone, but uh, you kind of just learn to live with it when you sit in your garden for so long, not moving, and <laughs> pretending like you're looking at birds, but really you're just looking at bees. But let's get into some weird wasps. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a Newman moth, a Newman wasp, uh, but this kind of uh, gets into uh, some of that primeval bee shaped that you see. Um, this is a male, but the female has a long ovipositor, which is a like very basic stinger. And so all stingers of bees come from an ovipositor, and this spe species here is parasitic, and so they will use their ovipositor, or the females will use their ovipositor to lay their egg inside of the nest or egg or caterpillar of another species, and then that egg then has all of the food that it needs to grow up to become another wasp. Uh, but this guy was also on that evening primrose, and even though I didn't plant it, I've never seen it before. So, um, let's talk about this wasp. Oh wait, it's not. That is a locust borer beetle. A uh, fun example of, uh, oh geez, now I'm blanking on the term. Uh, I got no idea. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Batesian mimicry, thank you. Um, yeah, Batesian mimicry is when a species uh, develops the defense mechanism of looking like something else uh, that already exists in the ecosystem because it knows that the other species doesn't get preyed on because it's either poisonous or dangerous or will fight back if you try to eat it, kind of like this eastern yellow jacket, and uh, you can't see because the photos pulled back, but they were on the same plant at the same time, and this is that bone set, um, that wonderful flower, which I also did not plant. It was just in the seed bank of my garden and given space to grow. Uh, my favorite uh, example of Batesian mimicry uh, which is how I learned about it, is the Narcissus bulb fly, uh, which is a fly native to uh, Denmark and the Netherlands. And it's not native to the United States, but was brought over in the uh, bulbs of tulips and daffodils. And so their larva will eat the bulbs of those flowers, and then once the weather gets nice, they go out and pollinate. That's all they do, just pollinate, lay eggs, um, but they look just like bumblebees. And uh, this even fooled my wife uh, because she had this photo set as her uh, iPad backdrop, <laughs> thinking that it was a bumblebee. Um, and so I asked her, why do you have a photo of a fly as your <laughs> background on your iPad? She was like, thought it was a bumblebee. And she still has it, because she just likes to pick it. Um, but then we also get some other interesting beetles. Uh, 
uh, this is a model for this beetle and it's like pretty much entirely shiny gold um, pretty cool uh, just weird little beetle don't know much about it but uh, it's also transparent along the edges there um, just an interesting bug that I see every now and then um, but they, these are my favorites love, love all the leaf hoppers I never knew that leaf hoppers were so diverse there's like I feel like at least once a summer I see a species that I didn't even know existed I had a running joke with a buddy that uh, he needs to go back to school to study leaf hoppers and write a PhD uh, thesis about why they are so weird. Um, he's not doing it, and I'm giving him grief about it. Uh, but we also see some very interesting beetles. Uh, this is a reddish brown stag beetle, which comes out on like June nights. Um, but their larva exist in the soil uh, in digesting uh, the rotting roots of trees and other woody debris that um, so their ecological niche as larva is to uh, return all of those nutrients back into the soil uh, but their larva do this for uh, three years until they emerge as beetles for just one summer. Um, but while I was doing all of the renovation work on my garden and building the uh, retaining wall, I kept finding these guys, the larva of these guys, and I had no idea what they were. And um, I had it narrowed down so I like close enough to where I thought it was at, but I couldn't actually guarantee it. Uh, and so I was extremely delighted when I found one of these uh, earlier this summer. But then where there is bugs, there are frogs and other predators. And we live relatively close to some wetland. And so in like around July, when all of the tadpoles have turned into baby frogs, there's like a just one day where my like a horde of them just arrive in my backyard. And one day, last summer, I think I counted 24 of these tiny toads. And I've had a couple of residents uh, like this guy. Uh, he's like, well, he's a big fat boy. He's like that big on him. Um, yeah, they're just like chilling in my bird bath slash bubble bee bath and doing whatever. My dog likes to. Uh, look at them. I think he learns that they excrete uh, slime if you try to put them in your mouth. So um, he does not try to do that anymore, but I think he did uh, when, they, like, when he first had free reign over the backyard. Um, but who knows. Um, but so far I've identified uh, 40 plus bee species there's a lot of species that I can't identify, which is like the coolest part about all of this to me. Um, so you get low estimates. Um, 40 plus bee species, 25 wasp species, uh, 20 butterfly and moth species. Moths are drastically undercounted because most of them are nocturnal. And I don't see them during the day all that often. And um, my neighbors do lie. Um, I, I don't even know how many additional species, but 74 birds. Oh, this is a bird club. Uh, that's a lot of birds. Um, I grew up in Rockford, and behind our house was like 300 acres of like overgrown farmland. And when I got married and moved, our house's life list was at 84 species. And I was like, I'm moving to the city. I'm not going to see that many species but lo and behold <laughs> birding there is almost better than it is at where I grew up uh, but 12 mammals and amphibians uh, my favorite being a fox I saw a fox a couple of weeks ago um, and that was very surprising and cool um, but that's a lot of biodiversity for three parking lot spaces 
and so yeah, some of the birds are flying overhead, and the mammals are in the front yard instead of the backyard. But um, you know, they're being attracted to all of these species that are using my three uh, parking lot spaces as habitat. Um, so everything in my backyard has a relationship with every other living thing to create harmony and balance. And I observe these species because I chose to enter into a relationship with them. I chose to put that hard work in and restore that little section of habitat with the species that belong there and allow them to create the relationships that naturally occur and support the things that are outside of my backyard. And of course, my, gar my garden will change over time and as these species continue to discover that balance amongst themselves, kind of like that plant that's moved 10 feet. Like, I don't know why I did it, but I'm not gonna force it to stay in the spot that it didn't prefer. And you can't force things to work, but you can put the time and effort to create a meaningful change. And the same thing applies to our people communities here, right? You can put in that time. You can choose to create a place where people feel loved, they feel valued, and they feel seen. And by providing these open opportunities for people to discover their own entry points into nature, we can allow them to discover their own uh, passions in life and allow them to fulfill that ecological niche that they love. Um, but people who feel supported by a community want to give back, they want to protect that community. And it's not just because it's a space where they can pursue their passions or their hobbies, but it's because it's a space where they feel seen, feel valued, and they feel important. So, here's what my burning buddies have taught me. Meet people where they're at. It's one thing to go for a walk and just tell everybody what the species are, you know, but if you allow them to ask questions and give them an opportunity, it begins to bring the joy of that discovery and being outdoors uh, to them because that's something that you can't really teach, you know, that intuition, that uh, that eye that comes with that and the natural curiosity that develops as well. Um, but also allow space for self-discovery, you know, allow, allow them to stop and point out weird things. That's a favorite part of summer Sundays is getting distracted by pawpaw and like going on an hour and a half long tangent trying to find fruit. It's like, whatever, that sounds great. Um, but that space for self-discovery allows uh, that natural curiosity and excitement to come uh, while you're in enjoying a space together. Um, but also invest in their lives outside of nature. You know, most of the time, uh, if burning is slow, we get talking about each other's lives and you know what's going on, and then that continues to be a like running conversation that you can just pick up next week pick up three weeks later. You know, it's showing interest and care in another person and making sure that uh, they feel valued and important and seen. Um, and I'm gonna end this with one of my favorite things that I like to say at every uh, speaking engagement. Uh, you can't claim to care about biodiversity without caring about the diversity of the people that are enjoying that space with you. Um, you know, having the diversity of thought, uh, the diversity of life experience, the diversity in skill set, economic class, race, gender, doesn't matter. Those diversity and uh, different ways of existing in the world help make that ecosystem stronger. You know, just like the 120 species of plants in my backyard, I wouldn't see any of those insect species or birds or mammals without having that rich diversity that has brought everything together to enjoy that space within my backyard. So, thank you.
we're trying to encourage everyone to find their own space within you know, the ecosystem of our club. And so thank you so much for that. Of course, um, I know we're kind of running, running a little bit here, but if we have any questions, if you have maybe some of the cool plants in uh, Spencer's garden, or there's a lot of really cool information to take in, but do we have anyone have any questions? If not, if you think of something at another time, you know Spencer's around all the time, so you can <laughs> marinate on some questions too. But well, then Spencer's going to tell us very quickly about our next meeting. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's October thirtieth. Thirtieth. Um, Maddie Schaefer. Yeah. All right. Um, is going to be coming. Uh, they run Sun Visual, uh, the local artist and muralist. Uh, but also they started the um, Pleasant Peninsula Conservation Art and Activism Festival. And so we're gonna hear all about what that was like and why they choose to include uh, native species uh, within their art, so. Yeah, and if you're um, curious to see their art before we get together, you can of course find them on uh, Instagram, but if you're doing art prize stuff around downtown, I can't remember the name of the building, but just a beautiful, beautiful mural right across from Rosa Parks Circle. Again, I don't know the name of the building, but if you go to Rosa Parks Circle, spin around, you're going to see it. Tons of, it's all, it's a celebration of Michigan or Pleasant Peninsula, so um, check that out. Kind of, you know, maybe that's your homework assignment. <laughs> but, um, and we're going to keep it to like, two minutes, but do we have any interesting spottings because I know we're in the midst of fall migration. If anyone's seen anything amazing that we can't miss. All right, the usuals. All right, well, I hope you get a chance to get out there and enjoy some birding. Typically, I hang around after meetings to chit chat. I do have my special guest that I'm gonna ferry home for uh, the evening. I believe Spencer's generously offered. He's a, he always hangs chat. around to chit chat, so <laughs> you know you can find him. Thank you everyone for coming out. Really excited 